Hello and welcome to St. Andrews, where we are a community of faith united by the love of Jesus Christ, building disciples through worship, study, prayer, and service. Let us turn our hearts and minds to worshiping God. Let us pray. Holy God, your word is strong and leads our feet into your holy dwelling place. We pray, O oh God, that you would guide us, guide us with your word through the power of your Holy Spirit. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Our first scripture reading comes from the book of Proverbs, a couple of verses from chapter 16. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. It is better to be of a lowly spirit among the poor than to divide the spoil with the proud. And then we turn to the gospel according to Luke. Jesus also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and regarded others with contempt. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, was praying thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, thieves, rogues, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of all my income. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even look up to heaven, but was beating his breast and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his home justified rather than the other. For all who exalt themselves will be humbled, but all who humble themselves will be exalted. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So we're continuing our series on the seven deadly sins, and the first of the seven deadly sins is pride. Pope Gregory I in the 6th century listed pride as the ruler of all the other sins. C.S. Lewis called pride the great sin. But in our modern day parlance, we tell people to show pride. Show some pride in your school, treating pride as though it is a synonym for having a positive spirit. We celebrate Pride Month as a way of celebrating when people can fully express their true self. With all of these different definitions and uses of the word, it can be confusing when we talk about what we mean by pride as a sin. You might even be wondering if pride really is a sin. So we're going to run into the same problem, though, that we are uh, with each of the seven deadly sins. There is a part of each of these sins that feels right. For example, let's take sloth. Now, we know that rest and renewal are necessary for life and wholeness, but sloth is a sin. With gluttony, we run into the truth that food is necessary for our physical well-being. With lust, we know that the feeling of love and the sense of attraction that usually accompanies it is one of the necessities of life. And with pride, we know that having a healthy self-esteem and a healthy self-image are important not only for the development of healthy children, but for adults as well. So if there's a necessary life-giving peace to these sins, then are they really sins at all? Dante referred to sin as misplaced love or directing love and devotion that one should show to God to something or someone else. Another way of looking at this is that sin is when we put someone or something else in the place of God. So in the sin of pride, we are putting ourselves in the place of God as though we were something to be worshipped. Now we see this in the prayer of the Pharisee in Jesus' parable. His prayer shows that he is putting himself on the level with God. He is so busy praising himself that he forgets to praise the one he's praying to. Sure, he begins by thanking God, but his next words so elevate himself that we begin to wonder if he's forgotten that he is not God. 
You see, the sin of pride requires competition. If I'm the best in the world, then you are not. And the distortion of that, that is that sin of pride, that pride that I must elevate myself on the backs of others. To be prideful is to set ourselves apart or against others. It requires competition. Christian writer Grant Tomlin put it this way. At its root, pride is the desire to look down on everyone else. Or to put it differently, the refusal to recognize and admit the presence, equality, or even superiority of any other being. So does combating the sin of pride require us to do away with competition? I don't think we have to do away with competition altogether, but we might need to rethink it a little bit. A few years ago, I was gathered with my family, and maybe there were a few friends there as well, and we were watching the Tigers play football. Now, I don't remember who they were playing, but everyone in that house had to be a Clemson fan. So we cheered when the Tigers scored, we groaned when the other side did. And then there was this beautiful catch. It was one of those seemingly impossible catches where the throw really isn't that great. But somehow the receiver seems to, to float in the air and will the ball into his hands. The only problem is that this catch was not made by a Tiger receiver. Yes, we were disappointed and there was a bit of grumbling. And then I heard a voice pipe up and say, that was a beautiful catch. So if we are so competitive that we cannot acknowledge, even if we don't want to celebrate it, that we cannot acknowledge a good uh, performance by a competitor, then yes, we're probably flirting with sinful pride. Pride does not require an end to competition, but it does require to us to remember that we are not number one at the top of everything. Pride is a lonely sin. It's lonely because if we believe that we are the best at everything, then we push others away. We see the Pharisee in Jesus' parable do that with the tax collector. God, I thank you that I'm not like other people, thieves, rogues, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. In his prayer, he is pushing all of these others away. The Pharisee sees himself as set apart from all those that he deems less worthy than himself. He must separate himself from them, lest his worthiness be tainted by their unworthiness. And so the result of the sin of pride is loneliness. When we constantly push others away because they can't possibly compare to us, we end up lonely. If we are constantly comparing ourselves to others or competing with them, there's always an indicator going on in our head. There's always a rating of other people on a scale of worthiness in our brain. That's what pride does to us. When I'm in the throes of pride, my interactions with others might sound like this. I'm talking to someone and measuring something about them. And, and if they don't measure up to whatever I think I am, then I can push them away because the people around me are disposable. So if I see someone who I feel is superior to me in some way, then I must set myself up in competition to them. I must try to defeat them. When our inner monologue sounds like this, I'm prettier than her. I'm wealthier than him. I'm smarter than them. That is what pride sounds like. This constant struggle of competition or ranking pushes people away. So pride is a lonely sin. When we are caught up in pride, we are unable to build healthy relationships with others. And if we can't build healthy relationships as a society, then the whole community breaks down and suffers. That's what makes pride such a danger. It pulls us apart because pridefulness leads us to separate ourselves from others. So how can we avoid the sin of pride? Now, each of the seven deadly sins has been partnered with a virtue. So the sins are what we avoid. The virtues are what we seek out. Now, the virtue that is paired with pride is humility. So what is humility? 
The definition depends on the source that you use. Some say that humility is having a low view of yourself or a sense of unworthiness. That doesn't sound very virtuous to me. It doesn't seem like a virtue to believe yourself totally unworthy of anything good. So let's toss out that definition of humility because to have a low view of yourself or to believe yourself to be unworthy is not really going to combat pride. That's just taking it to another extreme. So the definition that I found that gets closest to the virtue of humility is one I found in the Cambridge Dictionary. The feeling or attitude that you have no special importance that makes you better than others. Lack of pride. So to be humble is to see your equality with others. This gets close to the biblical understanding that we have of humility. So when Jesus quizzed a group of uh, when Jesus was quizzed by a group of Pharisees about what the greatest commandment was, he replied, "You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind." And then he went on to say this, and the second is like it: "You shall love your neighbor as yourself." This is the biblical meaning of humility to love others as we love ourselves. This calls us to view ourselves as equally deserving of love with our neighbors. It is this commandment that helps us to combat the sin of pride. For if in the sin of pride we view ourselves as superior to other, in the virtue of humility we must view ourselves as equal to others. Humility doesn't require us to look down on ourselves or say that we're awful worms, not deserving of respect or love. True humility instead calls us to look at others around us and see their worth as equal to our own. Humility doesn't mean that we have to hide our skills. You may indeed be the smartest person in the room, but if you can't see the worth of the other people in the room with you, then you're committing the sin of pride. Humility doesn't require us to think that we can do nothing. Humility requires us to believe that others have gifts and skills too. It's a sense of equality at our core. It's a sense of shared worth um, that we all have as part of God's creation. Now, it might be strange to be sent out in this way, but I charge you, to go from wherever you are and be humble. Practice humility as you see the worth you bring to the world as well as the worth that others bring. May you embody what Christ commanded. Love your neighbor as yourself. And in loving yourself and your neighbor, may you find the gift and the virtue of humility. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let us pray. This is before we begin with prayer. Though I do want to say that this is um, a model of prayer that was uh, taught by Pope Francis, um, and it's called a five-fingered prayer. So, um, if you would like to, while we're praying, um, we'll we'll go through different fingers of our hand um, as a way of. It was taught as a way of bringing children uh, into prayer life, but I think it works for adults too. So. Let's go to God in prayer. God of all the fingers of our hands, help us bring our prayer concerns to you. Our thumb reminds us to pray for those who are closest to us, our family and friends. God, some of those people are sick, and we pray for their health and wholeness. Some are filled with joys of new life, new jobs, new homes. Some are struggling with challenges at school, at work, at home. Others are finding success and fulfillment, and we could not be more grateful. Our pointer finger reminds us to pray for those who help point us in the right direction. God, for our teachers, we give thanks and ask for continued strength, joy, and patience. For doctors and nurses and home caregivers who guide us to better health, may they remain healthy, hopeful, and attentive. For pastors and mentors and coaches, may they listen well and speak wisely. For police officers, firefighters, and all first responders, may their desire to protect and serve cover us all. 
Our tallest finger reminds us to pray for those in positions of power. God, we ask that you help guide the decisions and actions of our leaders, whether they be local city or county board members, leaders in state or national government, or supervisors at work. We ask that your will be accomplished through their thoughts and actions. Our ring finger is our weakest finger, and it reminds us to pray for those in greatest need. God, for all those who are in trouble or in pain, we ask your protection, provision, healing, and strength. For those who feel their choices are at an end, who cannot find a way to escape their addiction, who are forced to choose between paying for food or rent or medicine, O Lord, stay close to them. If we are among those in great need, give us strength and the hope to ask for help and to allow others to see and listen and respond to the needs we express. Our pinky finger reminds us that we can also pray for ourselves. God, we give thanks for all that brings us joy and for the many gifts we have received. We also hold concerns in our hearts that we entrust to you. Whether those concerns are big or small, we know that you will listen to all our prayers. O God, your steadfast love is from everlasting to everlasting. With confidence, we offer these prayers to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Go out into the world in peace. Hold on to what is good. Return no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the suffering. Honor all people as you love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord be kind and gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen.